So they were basically living in poverty. But the Chinese people, they developed their institutions, they developed their men and their women. And guess what? Their men can come to Africa. Because Africa, in the black world, we don't want to develop our men in a way that can support our women or in the black world as we should. Welcome to Kenganda. My name is Janita Maya, and this is the Repat Podcast. I'll let my co hosts introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. DJ Maintain, DJ and producer, living in Kampala for five years, proudly Caribbean. Okay. O'Shea Duke Jackson. Hey. 14,000th generation <laughs> African American <laughs> here in Kampala, Uganda, right now. Yeah. So, perfect. O'Shea, can you introduce this? Yeah, so this is a clip that I found uh, from the Honorable Nilly Fuller. He's uh, from D.C. He's probably the best expert. Many of you guys know him in the in the pro-black community in North America um, as one of the experts on handling white supremacy as a black person. I mean, he's he's the gold standard. Um, so we have this clip we want to play, and uh, we're going to react to it. Straight answer by talking just the way we're talking now. That's it. They allow us to do that. Now, at a certain point, when it starts taking effect, you can expect them to stop us from doing that. Us meaning what I'm doing right now. The reason the white supremacists, logically speaking, allow Neely Fuller to say the things that he's saying is because they don't look at Neely Fuller. The white supremacists learned a long time ago, before I was born, you don't have to pay attention to a spokesperson, a person that's speaking. Pay attention to the reaction of the people who are listening. And if the people who are listening are not changing anything that they are doing, so what? See, the white supremacists are pure scientists. They are very scientific people. They don't let their emotions dominate the science like non-white people do. We get fired up on emotion and forget all about logic. The white supremacists are surgical in their thinking. That's why they're successful at every move they make. Wow. And it has the non-white people. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they walk into a place and they will see a speaker, a black speaker, talking to thousands of people. Okay. But they'll listen to the black speaker for a few minutes. But mostly, they study the reaction of the people who are listening. And if the people who are listening all file away, all walk away, and do not change as a result of what was said, the white supremacists say business as usual. So they study the reaction of the people who are listening. They don't care anything about the speaker at all. You know, the black people applaud, you know, uh, black speakers all over the place and as far back as there have been black spokesperson or black, what we call black leaders which is really a misnomer you know but black people speak all the time Neely Fuller's speaking so what mm -hmm. if nobody listens and acts on what he's saying mm -hmm. the white supremacists do not care they don't care how many radio programs you have how many TV programs you can just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Uh, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Black people still hold on to what we, what I started this program with. Hold on tenaciously to what we call black culture. The white supremacists said, I invented black culture. That's what the white supremacists say. Black culture is nothing but a reaction to me. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And it's a very sorry reaction. It has four components. Primitive. Uh -huh. Pitiful, stupid, and are silly. Dr. Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Two people you named. Yes. What happened to them? They got killed. You better believe it. That's what happens to anybody who starts taking effect. Okay. Now, okay. everybody who's still breathing, including Neely Fuller, they ain't effective. All right? 
They kill you when you're effective. I got you, yeah. All right. I mean, in other words, Neely Fuller is supposed to be digging his grave. As long as he's breathing, he knows that he's not effective. Because the white supremacists will take you out of here in a minute. I mean, they got millions of ways of doing it, not just one or two. Mm. I mean, uh, there are a few people that didn't even, didn't even get off the ground, like Patrice Lumumba. Yes, yes. I mean, it didn't last no time. No. All right? Why? Because the Congo is real important to the white supremacists. Ooh. And they don't ever intend anytime soon, apparently, for anything constructive to happen among the black people in what we call the Congo. Mm-hmm. And they didn't take waste no time getting rid of Patrice Lumumba. No. And even the person that helped them to get rid of yes, right. Patrice Lumumba. Mm. And that was Moise Shambi. Mm-hmm. He didn't last no. Suddenly got cancer. Mm. See, he's talking about chemical warfare or whatever, mm. Mm. or disease warfare. Moise Shambi suddenly got cancer out mm. of nowhere. And I think that's happened to several other people. You listen to the four-minute clip. <clears throat> what do you think? So, of course, here is my introduction to why white people don't take black people. Mm-hmm. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Yes. Black people, and that includes African Americans, Caribbeans, and Africans, love to be fed... Uh, A lot of charisma. Look at the people that excite us. In America, we have the Dr. Umar Johnson. We have our uh, hooping and hollering black pastors. Those people who tell everybody hope is on the way. Bishop T.D. Jakes, his daughter, whoever else, right? These are people who every time Creflo Dollar... Um, These people are liars, in my honest opinion, right? And black people want to be lied to. So they feel that their situation is better. This is just in church. But overall, black lives matter. The white man's going to do this. We're going to go ahead and revolution's going to come. We like to feel like that's going to actually happen. Mm. But we know that that's not going to happen. I'm not even going to talk about certain other groups. You, some of you guys might even say, I know the minister, Louis Farrakhan, is very respected. You know, I won't even get into that. But if you want to throw him in there, let's throw him in there for a sake of argument. Right. He, he talks a very good game. He does. A lot of things he says is true. Mm. And there is no action behind it from the response of African-Americans or blacks around the world. Blacks are getting worse every day despite what he's talking about. Because black people know there is a price to pay for actually living the words of what, what Louis Farrakhan says. Cause even Louis Farrakhan won't do what Louis Farrakhan is saying. Cause he know he's going to be definitely right. A hundred percent. And white folks know that. Mm-hmm. And Louis Farrakhan know that. And there's no disrespect to Louis Farrakhan at all, but it's the yeah. truth. No, it's the truth. Dr. Umar talks a good game mm. all on his TikTok and with the white man in these uh these people, you talk about the white Jews and stuff. Mm. Everybody knows that black people are not going to do the work. Let me talk about Africa. Because we have some of the same people on the continent. Now I'm here, so I don't know who they are. But I know that the blacks that give the rah-rah speeches, Negroes like a good speech. And they, they forget what the speech is about. So much so that these guys who are politicians or who want to get big in African media, they know. All I got to do is give these rah-rah speeches and not do anything, but with the blacks, you don't have to show any results. So all I got to do is talk about these things. But white folks know that Negroes is going to just listen to that and not Mm. thing. We know that, right? Because it comes back to black people inherently don't want to do the work. And I'm not saying everybody don't, but most don't. So if you're a white person, you've been studying this for a long time. You know, um, the liberals, Black Lives Matter, these people are really crying to get closer to whites. Black people are afraid of white people leaving them to their own utopia. That's the situation. Because most blacks come here and deal with umeme and the lights go out, they wouldn't know what to do. 
Most black people cry about racism because they want to be closer to whites. Either they want to like, look at Black Lives Matter. All of them are in interracial marriages and they live in white neighborhoods. Black people are afraid of being in a utopia when blacks rule everything because they don't trust blacks. But they need to make white folks feel bad so that they can be closer to those whites. That's how that's how confused blacks are. So when they talk like that, look at those people. Typically, they all have homes or residences and communities and where no black folks are at. None of them. The corrupt leaders in Africa that talk about how we need don't get on time. We won't let the West defeat us. We won't change our narratives. Look at where they got houses at. Look who they signed contracts with. These is white folks, right? So the white man don't mind if you go there on TV and bash him. I don't care about that. Look at look at look at uh, 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 what was uh, one of NWA's most famous songs? Fuck the police. Yep, yep. Right? Yeah, yeah. People in Detroit were buying these CDs, white folks, and burning them. Right? Yeah. Well, who owned the label? Who was the manager? Jerry Heller. Jerry Heller. Yeah. Yeah. So white people are smart enough to say, "We don't care if you talk about us. It's a business." Mm. But you never gonna run nothing. You still sign our deals. And then black people in Africa, we talk about Africa is rising. Look at the GDP. Like we, we like to believe that a lot. And y'all get mad in the comments. I don't care. How can your GDP be rising about 5% every year? Which in China, in their greater years, 13, 14, 15%. And then your population is rising. You got to had 14 million people in 1986. Now you have 50 million. And you're bragging to me about a 5.1% increase in GDP? You're actually doing worse than what you were doing in 1960. But black folks like to hear that they're getting better and they don't want to do the work. The opposite side of that is black people inherently know if we do the work, we might have to have, we might be in a race war. We might have to. And most blacks don't want to go out there and, 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 and take that L. But we know one thing that the whites will take it. The whites will fight to the death. That's one thing that whites have shown us everywhere they are in South Africa. Black and Africans, why do you think South Africans are so, like, so hype? Like, mm. South Africans are so violent if they need to be. Because mm. the white South Africans are so violent. Are even more so. Yes. Mm. Black, white people can bro. Like, and, and, they, and they will show that they got, they drop their kids off in the forest and the woods and stuff like that. Hey, look, they're ready to go to war at any time. Russia, it don't matter. White folks just think differently than we do. Mm -hmm. Right? And the thing about it is, is that black people are begging for white people to take you seriously with no results. We have the reparations conversation. We have all these conversations and all of these conversations really lead to us being closer to them. That's really what we want. We want to be more closer to whites. We don't want to be by ourselves. We're scared to be by ourselves. Right. And so with that being said is, that if you go out there and you have rhetoric, oh, these white people, the white, you know, uh, back in the day, the nation of Islam was the one saying the white devils. Mm -hmm. People will come out and rah, 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 rah. But then you had Elijah Muhammad, who at the same time he was saying that, look at the problems he was having, those scandals. Yeah, he was, he was, he was highly compromised. He's having some issues. Mm. N nothing, not to say that the brother didn't have some good points because he did. Oh, he I think he's an honorable Elijah Muhammad was, but again, but he wasn't white, very honorable in the end, was he? He, he wasn't as honorable mm. as some people would like because again, mm. Malcolm X, and I can see why that happened because Malcolm X shouldn't expose his leader, and that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah. But Elijah Muhammad wasn't a threat. Yeah. But Malcolm was a threat. You know when he became more of a threat when he left. Yep. And and he and he and he he began a new path. And they were like, oh, we don't like this. Because he was, he was, he was like, came back from Mecca, a changed man. Yes. And he was grouping people from all different aspects. Right. And that's what, that's what they didn't want. Yes. So they just got him out. And so the real, and the, and the reality is, and I love some of the things the Nation of Islam do. Mm -hmm. I do. I have a lot of respect for the things that Minister Farrakhan says. Yeah. Um, I understand the side he took in um, in his statement against Malcolm or Ma before Malcolm, he said Malcolm yeah. should be put, put to death. Mm -hmm. I he was being loyal. I'm not gonna get into that. Yeah, but to me, it's obvious these guys, a lot of black leaders that we think that are so great, 
Mm-hmm. White people don't take them serious. Yeah. That's it. Mm-hmm. African leaders who talk against the West while they're taking loans from the IMF. Yeah. They're not being taken serious. And I'm going to say to them, the Repat Podcast, they don't take us serious either, which is okay. Because even the guy said, mm-hmm. I'm a speaker. They don't take me serious. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, at one point, you're going to want to take serious in this world as a black person. So then you need to go ahead and say, if I'm going to be taken serious, they might kill me. And then, but if that's for, what would it take for me to be a man, so be it. Right. We need to develop what we need to do. Because if we don't ever have that mindset that we want to develop our people such that if we have to die in the process, we're never going to get nowhere. That's the difference between the civil rights movement and the blacks that made a change for all of us. But that's why this generation is cow. We're the worst generation in comparison to our ancestors. They were much better than us. Yeah. So black people think that white folks take you seriously when they don't. And black people want to feel like somebody takes them serious. Yeah. When obviously we look at the Africans in Tunisia, mm. everywhere Africans go, Dubai, yeah, India. Yeah, yeah. Now when Chinese people go anywhere in the world, they're respected now. Yeah. Because they control their narrative. We don't control our narrative. Yes. Chinese people are respected anywhere they go. Yeah. It wasn't always like that. No, no, you're right. Yeah. But black people everywhere they go, they know your embassy ain't gonna help you. You know, look mm. at the way Africans in Ukraine. When Africans were in Ukraine. Oh, that was awful, man. But you're begging for you're begging for equality. And when mm. people don't take you seriously, they treat you like the bottom. Yet you want to feel like you have arrived. And you haven't arrived. And I'm here to tell y'all that you have, we haven't yet. We got a lot of work to do. And that's the thing. Black folks want to feel like something that the world don't perceive us to be. And white people, even if you're talking like that, mm-hmm. they don't care. No. F the white man. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. Y'all, you, you ain't going to do nothing. Because yeah. everybody know that Negroes don't want to do the work. And most of the folks that are doing that want to lie, be corrupt, take money and go spend their corrupt money and buy white neighborhood houses and mansions, which is what, look at London and France. They know these people lying. All right, come over here, put your money into, you know, Barclays. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the biggest, biggest, biggest investors in the slave trade. There you go. But um, I made some points on my phone. I know Joni was looking at me tapping no, my phone. Okay. I wasn't being unprofessional. I just made some no, notes. But um, what O'Shea said has resonated with me. And I just feel like, the marching and the walking and as Jonita says sometimes, the kumbaya is it needs to stop. Really? Yeah. It needs to be action now. Like um, I mentioned it before in a previous episode uh, in London, um, a guy from Tottenham called Mark Duggan, may he rest in peace, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, was shot dead by the police there. And um, the family went to the police station for answers and um, didn't get any and was just kind of like, I should have shushed away. Just, yeah. like, just get out of here. Right. And um, there was week long riots. Wow. In the UK all over. It spread from London and then it went to Birmingham, went to wow. Manchester. People were looting. And because the police, as as we say, like, we're just taking a piss, mm-hmm. like just abusing us at every turn. And it, and it didn't just stop with black people. It was immigrants as well, for like from Albania, Romania, mm. Polish. So all the, all the youths just got together there was like WhatsApp groups organizing themselves where to loot, when to loot, what? how to loot, all of that. And the government had to be like, all right, let's come to the table. And that's that's all they respect now. Like, like you say, like we're like the guy said in the video, right? Mm-hmm. You can talk and talk and talk. Right. But until you have effect, yes. that's when they're gonna come and get you. Yes. Right? So there's been a lot of dubious murders in, in the UK when people were talking and people were, you know, making a change. Right. So I think the time, like talking needs to stop now. Mm -hmm. We need to stop. We need to show them we're serious. Right. And we want our respect because you control our narrative. Yes. That's why wherever we go in the world, people say the same things about us. Yes. Because the narrative is not controlled by us. Yes. You have, say like for the Jews, for instance, Mm -hmm. you can't, you can't say anything bad because they control their narrative. No, nothing. And they know what happened to them. Yes. Like I was listening to um, Andrew Schultz Mm -hmm. and he was saying, they know the rhetoric. They know like how it started and they just nip it in the bud. 
straight right. away. We right. need to be the same. Yep. We need to control our story. Yep. Because I'm sick of people telling me about me and you know nothing about me. Yes. I'm probably one of the first black people you've ever met. Yes. But you've got uh, like an idea yes. of who I am and what I'm about and you don't. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't know if it's the same in the US or, or in, in Uganda, but like when I had <laughs> white friends at school, right? Mm-hmm. And then the day comes like, oh, can I come and chill out with you and play football or bar- or whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They're cool with me because mm-hmm. I'm a cool person, but they still have their prejudices, right? Mm-hmm. So when they come to my home, they're expecting to see like an unorganized home, like dirty, oh, funky smells mm-hmm. and all that. And when they get there, it like my mum is a clean, pristine. Oh yeah. Like, ev- like everything is there that you could possibly want. You could see their face like, well, this is not Shook. like you shot, <laughs> this is nothing like what my parents said. Oh, right, right, yeah, right. Like, like, like Stephen's dad is here, his mom's here, they both got good jobs, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can see like you're breaking down their prejudices. Yes. And um we need to take that to another level. Yes. Because I'm just I'm just sick of it. Right. I'm just I'm blatantly just sick of it, man. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the kumbaya and the marching and protesting, I know yeah. I guess the kumbaya and whatnot, uh-huh. but even if you say that we need to stop doing that, but doesn't the marching and the protesting get the word out there? The word's out there, but what's it done? There you go. Okay. There you go. And, and I'm surprised that maintain. He's, he's the liberal on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, you know what it is, Man. right? Because... Look at the transformation. <laughs> I've been hanging out with you too much, O'Shea. But no, this is a subject that's very like close to me because yes. I deal with that perception all the time. And um, I'm just, I just had enough of it, you know? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Um, as an African looking in, because like your mm. experience is definitely a different from mine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When yeah. we yeah. see these stories, you know, we, we see them mm. being remade into movies, into mm. series mm-hmm. and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And the end of the, of the series or the story mm. and whatnot, it's always like, oh, they did something and they overthrew this and, oh, mm. they did something and mm. that matching and protesting um, produced a positive, you know, impact or outcome. Yeah. But I don't think that, that's not the real thing in real life, is it? No. Nah. Because we're still in the same space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They may, they, they may placate us and be like, okay, calm down. Yeah, calm yeah. Calm down. We'll give you a little crumb or something. There you go. Negro trinkets, as we right. call it, America. Okay. So, yeah. and then we go off on our way like we, got, like we got the win, but we haven't. Right. And it's just all about narrative. We need to, we need to control our narrative. Yes. And um, <clears throat> how we go about that... I don't I don't have the answer to obviously but, I do <laughs> but you know it's um it's a long journey but we need to start it I do mm. we need to and I've noticed this since I've been one of the things about being in Uganda yeah um is like there's a blank map and you you're responsible for if you succeed or fail America is the same way but America has a lot more transparency but here you get to see like, okay, I'm hiring this person and that person is not where I need to be, but that person needs investment. All right. So we need to develop this person. Let's just say for this podcast, because yeah. we couldn't, we, we, we could pull this podcast off to, you know, when we first started last year, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we first started, had to plan, but we stopped. Yeah. <clears throat> but we didn't have the manpower if we did an episode like John was saying yesterday off camera, you know, we could do it like, all right, it'll come out sometime next week or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But we didn't, we couldn't be. That was then. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to put out a podcast, we could, if we really wanted to, we could put out one almost every day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is almost impossible to do in Africa. Yeah. But now what we're able to do is because, you know, when I do get the little money that I do get, we're reinvesting into our people. We're building our people up. Right. Yeah. And now we have a robust team. And we, we, we have a team that's developing people that are helping us. And one thing I noticed about the Chinese or um, the Turkish people, they really invest back into their people. They really want to keep their talent there. And a lot of times as blacks, you know, we have such a big man complex, especially some of the black men. We want to be the top guy. We want to be the rich guy. We want to have all the women. Mm. And when, and when we do that, 
we're not respecting the women in our community. We're not giving opportunities to our young men. Like Africa has a lot of able-bodied black men that need wives, right? And they, and these young men can work and they need to be, and they want to be men. Mm. But we're not looking at developing our men to develop our women. We want to have everything for ourselves. But I notice other groups, they look at these people and say, look, look, we need to have these structures ready for the next people. The blacks we're looking at, even ourselves, even some of us, as, as some of us as I'm from the diaspora, we're coming to Africa, looking at Africa as a lick. All right, I can come over here and pay this person 60 bucks a month. And then I can buy my mama, uh, I can buy my new house there in, 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 in San Diego or Sacramento or whatever else, you know? Yeah. Instead of looking at, this may be somebody from the community we can use in the African-American sector. Or we able to take this person from Uganda and use them in the Nigerian sector. Mm. And then we can take the money that we get and then we can develop our institutions. This is what other people do. And yeah. after a certain while, you have to respect what they do. Mm. You got to take them serious because look at like nobody took Nollywood serious at all. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Nollywood was beginning, a joke. In the beginning, yeah. Didn't take it serious at all. I mean, we had Kuhani here on a podcast from mm. Kenya. She said like, they used to laugh at Nollywood. Mm. But do we take Nollywood serious now? Yeah. yeah. You bet you we take it serious. Yeah. Do we take Afrobeat serious now? Yeah. This guy oh, well, burn, took it serious, but yeah. burn a boy mm. is causing thing. people. People in America are hating on the guy saying you stole your culture from us. I mean, because you know a lot of these guys have like gold chains. Obviously, there's got to be some. Where's well, gold from, though? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like there, there is definitely me. Like some of the, I mean, I'm sure he has rappers he likes from America, I mean, but yeah, yeah definitely, he's you, definitely influenced. But I don't he, think he's taken. No, from. I mean, but if you, the guy, I don't even understand what he's saying when he's rapping, <laughs> right? Half the the nation doesn't understand what he's saying. Yeah. Mm. What a, Nigerian, the, the way that, the, the thing about I'm a piano mm -hmm. in Afro beats. Yeah. I love that piano. I'm a piano. Just yeah. in South African house. Mm. That don't sound like nothing else but them. Yeah. For real. You gotta give them their props, so man. You know, I'm definitely. a piano. When it comes on, the beat comes on, well, you can say, eh, you know, yeah, you, 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 you already know yeah, what it is. Just, just, just like Oakland Bay area rap yeah. music. When like yeah. Oakland comes on, like the way they dance, you're like, mm. that dude is from Oakland. Right. You know what I'm right. saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He from Ghost Town. You know what mm -hmm, I mean? Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, is that you're seeing that these industries are getting better because like back in the 60s and 70s in uh, like Liberia, when William Tubman was the president, he had the right plan. Okay, we're going to send you to Morehouse to get a degree, mm -hmm. but you're going to come back to Liberia. Yeah. That was, yeah. That, that was happening in early Nigeria too. We don't do that. When, you know, we don't have anything to invest into young black women in America, young black women in Africa. We don't develop our talent. And we have so many smart people that can do things and we don't give our men anything. And then our men can't give their women anything. You, you see what I'm saying? That's why when foreigners come to Africa, I've seen this before. I don't want to say where I was at. I've seen a person in the apartments I was staying with. It was a bunch of, it was a bunch of junk. She, 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 it's 2020. Remember during lockdown, there were some Egyptian guys. Yeah. Stand across. Yeah. There was a certain guy fetching Ugandan girls for these Egyptian guys. Yeah. Okay. Well, mission. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yes. And it was right there in front of our face. And at the time I was dating this person, right? Mm -hmm. So she went out there and she was like dancing. The guys hovered her. I had to go outside and I was like, yo, so the guys, I was like, they, 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 they scared away. I said, yeah. come here, bro. Don't you ever invite, because they was fighting the guys over there to look. Don't you ever invite foreigners to your women. Right. Right? Right. But that's a young man that don't have no respect for his community, don't have no respect for his women. Whereas if we we're in Egypt, I could never go. No. Right? Never. Head cut off. Yeah. You wouldn't, exactly. come, you wouldn't come back. Not even close. Yeah. No, no Arab woman would even be allowed to go out there and do that. Right. No okay. Way. So this is what comes in. But when you don't, when, when men feel like they're not empowered, they don't have a community. We need African men able to be men. We need black mm -hmm. men able to be men. And then we have a lot of eligible women out here who need husbands who need to be taken care of. But if we don't invest yeah. in our young people, we have so, like the money I always talked about maintain, you know, I see and maintain eyes, you know, maintain is rich, right? So maintain eyes get real big when I talk about the opportunity that we have. Cause we're gonna be, we're gonna take our uh, repat podcast to Ghana. We're gonna be all over the black world, just like everybody else, right? We're gonna be there. But here's the thing that I want to talk about: we have to put the money to our people. 
Yeah. That's the one thing I want to say. Invest. If you don't get anything from me, you don't have to like me. Wherever you were at, invest into your people. Do that. Because once we start doing that, we can't help but come up. Yeah. Right? Because they can't stop you from bringing your skills back to Nigeria, back to Uganda, back to black America. We need, my goal before I die is, we have an agreement between Uganda and the HBCU system. So if you want to study mechanical engineering at Florida a and boom, go. Yeah. From Uganda. And I'm talking about a kid that nobody thought was going to be rich. He doesn't read elite family. Go. Prairie View, agriculture, a and uh, agriculture, PhD. Go there. Come back. We got a job waiting for you here. That's how we develop our people. But we don't do that. So they don't take us serious. Because white people know if you give blacks the money, they're going to trick. Like, look at entertainers. Do you think that they're, they used to be scared to give entertainers money? And they figure something out. NBA players, look at John Morant. You heard of him? Yes. Yeah. Do you think that white folks, like, you give this guy $300 million. What is he going to do? Go to the club with <laughs> White people laugh at that. <laughs> That's an issue, right? Because from what I understand about the John Morant issue is he grew up in a, like a very, like a decent family home, right? And he's trying to aspire to the hood side. Look at his daddy. Uh-huh. His daddy wants to be a thug too damn near. He had all the games at the clubs and stuff too. Almost. Right. Okay. He got a young, he got a daddy that's trying to be a superstar himself. Okay. So when, when these black athletes, entertainers get the money, they know you're not going to reinvest into your community. You're not going to build your people up. They know that. They know that because they've conditioned us. There you go. Because they've made us, like our, our self-worth is, is low. Yes. So to, to make ourselves feel better and then present ourselves in a way which will just, some people want to be accepted. Some people just want to live and just yeah. not be bothered. So you yeah. dress a certain way, you go certain places. But it's like Jay-Z said, isn't it? In, in, in his song, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a billionaire. I go to all these meetings, I go to all these things. But I'm still looked at as the N-word. There you go. So they know. They, they have very, very, very confident that when it comes down to it, we're going to try to do something which gives us peace of mind and be accepted by them. Mm-hmm. And they they prey on that, right? But um, I want to go back to something uh, the guy said in the video, right? Mm-hmm. So you know, like when um, the Capitol was stormed in America, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Would you call the people who did that white supremacists, or they were they were they just like fanatical sort of? You mean Donald Trump? Those people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, you know Donald Trump. Man, he got all kind of supporters. Man, even some black ones. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I. Like, I, okay, so the white people that follow him, that, that stormed the Capitol, would you call those white supremacists? No, I would mm-hmm. call white supremacists because in my terminology, white yeah. supremacists yeah. are people that can enact, not the normal guy. Those are normal people. Right. Gotcha. Normal white people can't stop me from doing stuff. Right. White supremacists are the ones that own industries. Right. They make laws. Because for you to be the white supremacist, you have to be able to make laws. Mm-hmm. You have to make systems. Right. So you need to be elites. Mm-hmm. Elites are white supremacists. Okay. Not normal, disgruntled white. Nobody cares about those people. Right, right, right. Even white folks don't care about those people. Mm-hmm. They do the bidding. They do the bidding. Mm-hmm. But the people who enact laws, and they may get on camera and they don't ever say anything racist about blacks, but behind the doors they're pulling the strings. Those are white supremacists. Okay. Black people want to fight people on the streets who say the N word. That's like, they don't care about that person. Mm. The systems who are created or maintained are the real white supremacists. The ones at the World Bank, the IMF Bank, the ones that give Africa the bad loans, mm. the ones that reject you from college, the ones that put the, col- the, the, the redlining policies in, those are white supremacists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. The ones who are at the top where you're at the bottom, mm-hmm. those people will not give their position up unless they were white supremacists are more likely to be that. So the ones who have power over the institutions or over how things work. Got you. Normal white people in Kentucky who are poor that don't like black people. Who cares about them? Like, right, don't waste my right. time. Okay. Go somewhere. I, I, I often group them in the same barrel, I suppose. So that's why I asked the question. I wanted to hear your opinion on it. Me, me personally, yeah. I don't even take those people serious. Like, if oh, you're yeah. a white person in America and you have a problem with black people mm-hmm. and I find out that you're like a truck driver or something like that, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I don't even waste my time. Okay. Black people feel like I've 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 got something because I beat this white guy up who said the N word. Mm. Now I have some power back. Like and then white folks don't even care about that person you beat up. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about judges. Yeah, yeah. we're talking about yeah. lawmakers. Mm-hmm. We're talking about policymakers. Mm-hmm. We're talking about people who run banks. People who give loans. People who give loans to one person and don't give loans to other people. Right. Those are white supremacists, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. But then here's where we as the black world come in. We have the opportunity. We can meet. We get our money. We can put, spend our money as we want. <clears throat> you know? So we have the opportunity to, 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 to respond, which we are doing. And what we try to tell people in the black world is, is that Africa, one thing I like about Africa, I never feel, is I have my problems here. I never feel like I can't get anywhere here in this continent. I never feel like that. Same. In America, I feel like, all right, maybe I got a ceiling here. Or something it's like, that. It's like they're saying it's, it's a glass ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. You're just looking up at it, but you just can't. Yeah. I feel through. like that's yeah. sort of there. Here, yeah. I don't feel like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So, but that comes with having uh, operating like my brother George Macon says with the black mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of blacks are operating with black skin in a white mind. And the first thing that the white man does is the white man wants to empower his people. The Chinese man wants to empower his people. The Singaporean man wants to empower his people. The Arab man wants to empower his people. The black man wants to empower himself to make himself look better than his people. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. So we have to understand that it takes me reinvesting into what I want to see because I'm not going to always be here. What about the, not even just my kids in Africa, you see, my kids, my wife, that's it. My side chicks, yeah. mm-hmm. and me taking pictures on Instagram, and people praising me. That's the black man's stupidity around the black world. But the Asian man don't look like that. Like look, this, look this guy in Zambia, a guy built a, a business worth two hundred and fifty million dollars in the Chinese community. Mm. It's rallied behind this guy because look at how he's changed their lives. We have to look at what we do for our group because then our group is going to come in and develop us. And then somebody's going to come in and develop us. Right. Right. Then we're going to, our our institutions will get better, but we're never going to catch up to the whites. If we're just basically trying to take everything for ourselves. And that's why they don't take us serious, but the white man take Chinese serious. In 1976, Chinese was all farmland. Right. So they were basically living in poverty. But the Chinese people, they develop their institutions, they develop their men and their women. And guess what? Their men can come to Africa because Africa in the black world, we don't want to develop our men in a way that can support our women or in the black world as we should. Yeah. And I'm not trying to make this a thing, but but you, you got to invest in your men and your women. Women yes. got to be safe, man. No, for real. You know, you, 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 and your men got to be able to have communities that work together. And if the other rest of the world, I've seen Turkish men in Ukraine come and build lifestyle as a, as a, as a company. Third biggest company. And they come there, they help each other. The men come there, do that. Boom. They bring the women over, organize things. Same thing with Chinese women here. Chinese women here are running shops in Uganda. Mm. But because their men have come in and paved the way for them to do that. Yeah. And we're the only group of the, in the black world that 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 feel like we don't have our men paving the way for the women in the black world. Every other group does that. So until we do that and and the one thing about the white man he is he does not look at the black man as equal. The black man mm-hmm. cannot provide for his people like the white man can. So when the white man noted that that's why they said that, that he said the four pillars yeah, one yeah. of them mm-hmm. is, why do you think that whites are not afraid of rappers? Are actors. Remember, both all since these guys are paid entertainers. Mm. Why does everybody want to be a rapper? Like Blueface. Does somebody take him serious? <sighs> no. Christian Rock? So oh no. Bo Jane goes back in the day? No, these people are stupid. in the whites create an industry for that for you to be there to make fun of your own people because all you're gonna do is talk about destroying your own community. Well, that's why hip hop has changed, right? Yes. Because when I was growing up and listening to hip hop, you had public enemy, you had X Clan, you had De La Soul, you had people speaking about real things that uh, that affected and and creating solutions to this. So they said, all right, we, we run all these record labels. We run all these institutions. We want this type of hip hop. The drinking of the lean, the, 
the, the, the negative imagery, the tattoos on the face, not that there's nothing wrong with it, but it's, it's just like, everybody looks the same. Mm-hmm. It's like, I call it conveyor belt hip hop. Yeah. And that brings me back to the point he said where uh, white supremacists say they created black culture, right? They didn't. That's one, that's the only thing I didn't agree with him. Mm-hmm. They didn't, they stole from it. And they was able to steal from it because mm-hmm. they've had a foothold in the Western world right. way before we did. And right. they've set themselves up well. So they had all the record labels, they had all the distribution. Yes. They're the ones who set the, the artists getting what 0.5 cents mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. per every $10 album sold. Yes. Right? So they didn't create black culture. What they've done, they've stole from it. Because mm-hmm. name a genre, the, the majority of the genres out there, we've invented house, mm-hmm. techno, mm-hmm. hip hop, jazz, Elvis. Blues. Yeah, Elvis, mean, Elvis saved himself. Well, the, the, he the, like the, the, from the Rolling Stones stole from Scar and like, yeah. like all of that, right? So, um, and the blues. So we create it, mm-hmm. they exploit it. Mm-hmm. So I don't agree with that. And that mm-hmm. touches me because I'm, I'm in music, right? But that touched me. They didn't create black culture. They just steal from it. And then what they do, they, they eventually whitewash it. Mm-hmm. So, because when I was a kid, I thought white house music was invented by white people. I did too. Until I did my research. Oh, we invented that. Then Scar, right? The, the, uh, it's, that's early, early reggae. I thought that was a white invented genre. No, it's not. Yeah. So it's it's not that they they invented it. They've just taken it and exploited it. And now they've got it where they want, where it's just negative. Mm-hmm. And um, there's no diversity. Right. Because before you had so many diverse, you had De La Soul over here. Oh N- yeah. NWA here. Right, you also had um, a crew called the Hieroglyphics with Del, the, the funky Homo sapien, who was Ice yeah. Cube's cousin, and all that. Different guys speaking about different things. Public so, enemy, yeah, public enemy. Um, you had Booyah Tribe, you had Ice T, Chub Rock, Chub Rock, exactly. So you had so many different. Now, that was before your time, yeah. you lost right yeah. now. You don't know what no, you're talking I'll, about. I'll break it down. To you. I'm learning. So, but yeah. now all you got little this, little that, little this, little that, yeah. little that, and they're all the same, and they're all doing the same thing, and that's what they want. Mm-hmm. You know, mind numbing, like, like, you know, like, I don't, I don't want to diss the artist, but stupid music. Yeah. And, and they're happy with that. But when it was public enemy and all those things, they'd be like, they was getting their phones tapped. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's how scared they were of it. So that's why the music industry has changed. Yeah. That's why you see Damon Dash all the time going at Leo Cohen. Mm-hmm. Because he's just he he's seen it firsthand. Mm-hmm. But people, because Dame Dash style is abrasive, people are just like Right, right, right. right so right, they right, just right. Part but if you if you deep what Dame Dash says mm-hmm. about about our community and supporting women and, and, and bringing people up, you know you know what he's saying is, is the truth, but like the guy said, Dame Dash is not effective. Okay. Mm-hmm. At the at present. But the minute he does, because he's got his own Dame Dash studios. All those things. Once he starts getting effective, you watch what happens to him. Anyway, okay. that's my last point. It has <laughs> been an interesting episode. Um, yeah. It's definitely being been an eye opening episode and learning. I'm sure not everyone gets what's mm. out there. So if you watch this podcast and learn mm-hmm. from it, mm-hmm. you know, that's, yeah, that's all. What good. it's all about. Yeah. Any last remarks, guys? No, that was my last, last remark. Yeah, yeah, last you last know, remark. I gotta have like I'm long winded. So yeah. Yeah. the thing is, is just you know, like you know, I think that the black world is the elephant that has his leg tied around the, the branch and just yeah. won't pull it. Yeah. Yeah. When I look at Uganda, there's so many things I don't even know about Uganda. I don't even know about all the opportunities that are here. But man, we have like the greatest diaspora. I don't know how many times I got to say it. Mm-hmm. That the greatest diaspora. Preach. We, we, we have some of the most diverse talent. We have the money that's there. We have the ingenuity that's there. Mm. We have everything that we need to do what you need to do. Yeah. I don't even worry about, and thank you for people who super chat and yeah. stuff like that on the, you know, y'all are the ones that pay for this carpet, right? Um, so <laughs> nice. we, we have so much opportunity. I, you know, this is a, this is a, SBK sent me something about Joe Button. Joe Button said, now with his podcast, it's not lucrative enough on Spotify because they have to make different shows. Yeah. So his Joe Button podcast no more is good enough. Now they have to have different shows, different weeks to make the same money they used to make. Right. And then I thought about the Repat podcast. Mm -hmm. That is like, literally, we don't have to worry about that because of where we're trying to go. Right. (laughs) 
we have the greatest diaspora in the world on planet Earth, and we're talking about these topics. I don't have to worry about where we're going to go. But the one thing that I am worried about is how black people see each other, right? That's yes. a big problem. That's the, the, that's the problem. You get, we got black London. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've seen shots to Tobio. They have market day here every um, April. And uh, we just need more entrepreneurs collaborating and solving the problems for us. Yeah. Um, we and need controlling the narrative. Controlling the narrative. Like you said, we don't see each other. Yeah. In that, in that way. In that way. Yeah. And if we can do that, then we got to, um, the worst of the world has a big problem. Yeah. So, but because the opportunity is there, the money is there, the opportunity is all there. But, but if your mind is messed up, then it doesn't matter. And then they can't take you serious because you don't see it. Mm-hmm. So I would challenge you, you know, if you live in any city, Indianapolis, Indianapolis, Chicago, London, Birmingham, UK, or Alabama, Uganda, Accra, start meeting up. Start being a genuine person. Start looking at the issues that you can solve. And you'd be surprised where that can come from. And we can all start doing things together. Like we're going we're gonna to, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to somehow sacrifice so we can go all to Accra, yeah. go and meet those people. Man, we have everything that we need yeah. in the black world. We do, we, it's not like Africa 20 years ago. This is Africa 2020. We have everything. We have, you know, internet shouts, you know, internet providers. Mm -hmm. So we're on the page where we can do things for ourselves now. We have a great dashboard that can support us. Let's do things for ourselves. Yeah. yeah, and control the narrative. We can control the narrative. Yeah. Well yeah. said, well said. Maintain to the point they can find you. Yes, you can find me at DJ Maintain, all social mediums, find my mixes, the events I'm playing at, production, all that good stuff. Perfect. Okay. At O'Shea Duke at, uh, on Instagram, O'Shea Duke Jackson on YouTube. Yeah. The Pan-African Dating Show. Yeah. Mm. Y'all okay. don't give me no credit for that because, yeah, you know. Executive no, he's producer. That, he's that, the producer, the executive producer. The but shout out to Sim right now. Yeah. And, and sometimes you produce over there too. Yeah. People don't know you be coming up with some of the stuff, I you know. know? <laughs> Thank you. Do you like the do you like the podcast more or do you like the producing for the Pan African? I know always be my baby, so I like the podcast more. No offense to the PDS. You don't it's want to produce great, over there? But no. You don't want to do it anymore? No I'm good here. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the Pan African dating show, so make sure you subscribe mm. to that and see what we have over yeah. there. Also, oh. follow us on all our social media platforms at King Anna Nation. Subscribe to this channel, hit the bell for notifications. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>